Well, now that we know how to compute third law entropies, whether we measure them experimentally or compute them from first principles, let's work a bit on aligning those entropies with our intuition. And so let me uh, illustrate a few 298 Kelvin standard molar entropies. And we'll always use the SI units of joules per Kelvin per mole. And so let's start with some solids. So here we have the entropies of carbon in two different allotropes, its diamond form and its graphite form. And it has very small entropies at 298 Kelvin. So if you remember, at this temperature, uh, nitrogen gas had a huge entropy of almost 200. But for these solids, it's only a couple percent of that, 2.4, 5.7, so a bit higher for graphite. And then we also have some uh, metals. So these are not the atoms, but the solid form. So sodium metal, potassium metal, silver metal, 51.3, 64.7, 42.6. So these about tenfold larger than is the case for carbon. Well, so what about diamond compared to graphite? Uh, sort of an intuitive test. So we know that diamond is one of the is the hardest substance on Mohs scale of hardness, if I remember back to my grade school science classes. Uh, and the reason it's hard is it has an incredibly stiff lattice. So the carbon atoms in a lattice are in a beautiful diamond-like arrangement. And graphite, on the other hand, is not as stiff. Graphite is easily broken, and uh, it's a just a different form of carbon. And so the graphite has a somewhat higher entropy because it can have a bit more disorder in its solid lattice. Meanwhile, the metals differ from carbon insofar as they are uh, conductors as opposed to insulators. And so in conductors, there are accessible states to the electrons. So a conductor allows electrons to flow. And those electrons can access states that are continuously available in a sense. And that contributes to the entropy of conducting metals. And so they just have higher values. Let's do another sort of intuitive check and compare liquids to gases. And so if we look at water or bromine, both of which can be a liquid or a gas uh, pretty readily at 298 Kelvin, the liquid forms have substantially lower entropies than the gaseous forms. And that simply reflects the condensed nature of the liquid reduces its entropy. There's less disorder when you condense everything as opposed to allowing it to fill a large volume. Now, bromine, irrespective of the phase, liquid or gas, has substantially higher entropy than water. And so most of that is associated with the, just the greater mass of bromine. So if you remember, we'll see it again in a, a little bit, the, the expression for entropy involves mass in the numerator of, an, of some expression of a logarithm. So as the mass goes up, the entropy goes up. And then in the gas phase, that difference grows a little lower. So here it's 82 joules per Kelvin per mole. Here it is 57, I guess that works out to be roughly uh, joules per Kelvin per mole. And one of the reasons for that is that water is a nonlinear molecule, unlike bromine. And so it has some additional rotation, it has an additional rotational degree of freedom. And you may recall that rotations can contribute significantly to entropy. And so that's something not available to bromine, and uh, that dictates some of the change in the difference. What about gases? So here are a variety of gases, and it'll become more clear in a moment why I've, I've tabulated them this way. Here we have the noble gases. And they range in entropy from 126.2 at room temperature, joules per Kelvin per mole, through neon, argon, krypton, xenon, up to 169.7. And so what's the reason for this variation? Well, again, I'll, I'll ask you to remember that the translational piece of the partition function and its appearance within the expression for entropy involves the mass of the molecule. So I've ordered these by increasing mass. And you'll notice that th the difference as they go up is it increases 20, it increases 8, it increases 10, it increases 5. So the increase is getting smaller and smaller. And that's because it's not the mass, it's not linear in the mass. Remember, it's the log of the mass. So I'll show that to you graphically in just a moment. But that's the behavior we expect. As things get heavier, there will be a decreasing influence of, of becoming heavier. 
Now, the next series of gases I have plotted over here are molecular fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And again, these are increasing from 202.8 up to 260.7. So, by coincidence to some extent, if you were to compare the masses along these arrows that I've indicated, it turns out argon, it weighs almost exactly as much as molecular fluorine. And krypton is very close to molecular chlorine, and xenon is very close to molecular bromine. However, the diatomic halogen gases have substantially more entropy, even though they have roughly the same masses, as do the noble gases. And why might that be? Well, the noble gases can't rotate. They're just atoms. But the halogen gases have two rotational degrees of freedom. And so there's a contribution then to rotational entropy, which depends on the rotational temperature. And we're way above rotational temperature at 298 Kelvin. And so that's the reason for the extra entropy in these diatomics compared to their mass similar monatomics. Over here, finally, the last set of gases, these are the hydrogen hal halogen gases, I guess I'll call them, hydrogen halides, we could say. Uh, HF, HCl, HBr, and HI. Again, increasing entropy as I go to increasing mass of the halogen. And if I were to look at similar masses, I have that F2 is actually relatively close to HCl in mass, Cl2 to HBr, and Br2 to HI. What we observe is that the entropy decreases as uh, we go from the dihalogen, the diatomic halogens, to the hydrogen halogens. So why might that be? Now, you might be tempted, given what's going across the bottom of the slide, to say, aha, we've talked about the translational part, we've talked about the rotational part, maybe it has something to do with the vibration. But that probably would be a bad answer. There's two reasons it might not be such a great answer. One is we know that at room temperature, usually it doesn't seem like vibrations contribute all that much to entropy. But in addition, if you were to ask what's the frequency of one of these hydrogen halides compared to one of these dihalogens, well, all right, one might not know that off the top of one's head. But in general, bromine, for instance, has a very weak bond to some extent. and It has a low vibrational frequency. But as soon as you attach a hydrogen atom to something, you're talking about a very high vibrational frequency because of the way reduced mass plays a role in the vibration. So one would expect the vibrational entropy to be even smaller for the hydrogen-substituted halogens compared to the dihalogens. No, so in fact, what's playing a role here is, is not, so I'll put it in brackets, not the vibrational component to the entropy. It's still the rotational component. So it depends on rotational temperature. And what does rotational temperature depend on? It depends on the moment of inertia. And so these molecules have very large moments of inertia, especially as we get to the really heavy ones, because you've got big, heavy atoms on some sort of a rotor. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is the lightest element in the periodic table. And so it contributes very little to a moment of inertia. So because these have lower moments of inertia, they have uh, more distantly spaced rotational energy levels, and there's less disorder because there's less accessible levels at a given temperature. And that reduces the entropy then. So really, this is a, a great table to assess one's appreciation for what's contributing, how much you'd expect it to contribute, and, and what trends you'd expect to see. So let me just plot those now on a common scale. Those are all the numbers I showed on the last slide in units of joule per Kelvin per mole, plotted as the log of the mass of the molecule itself. And so here are the noble gases. And you see that, sure enough, it's roughly linear in the log rhythm of the mass. Here are the dihalogen molecules. And they, too, are still linear in the mass. So since all were very, well, we're also varying a little rotation, but it doesn't show up here. Uh, it, it, it has the expected increase in entropy associated with an increase in mass. There will also be some associated with a change in moment of inertia, but it must be increasing also with log of mass. And then finally, we have the HX series. So each of these series is unique, co comparisons being made within itself. And when we were focusing on things having similar mass, like these three, mo these three two molecules and an atom. They all have a similar mass. And yet the noble gas has the lowest entropy, because all it has is translational entropy. 
The hydrogen halide has more because it can rotate, but its moment of inertia is smaller than the dihalogen, and so it gets a little extra rotational entropy, and it's highest here on the uh, axis of entropy. So variation within a series primarily dictated by mass, relationships between series differentiated by rotational entropy. All right. Well, having made those points, let me give you a chance to exercise your intuition on a series, and then we'll come back. Well, let's wrap up with just a few more comparisons. I want to look now at some polyatomic gases. So still at, at 298K, I've got carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, methane, acetylene, ethylene, and ethane. And uh, one of the purposes of this slide is to illustrate, again, the amazing agreement between calculated entropies, so using only properties of the individual molecules, their mass, their rotational temperature, their vibrational temperature, and the degeneracy of their electronic ground state. These are the calculated entropies. These are the experimental entropies. And you observe that to within 0.1 joules per Kelvin per mole, spot on quantitative agreement. But our goal here was to look a bit more at trends. So let's look at CO2 versus NO2. So CO2 and NO2 weigh very, very nearly the same. Carbon has a mass of 12 in its most abundant isotope, nitrogen a mass of 14. But there's a difference of 27, 26.5, I guess, if we want to be careful, in their entropies. So why is that? Well, the issue is that carbon dioxide is a linear molecule. Nitrogen dioxide is a bent molecule. It's nonlinear. And so remember that a linear molecule only has two rotational degrees of freedom. The nonlinear nitrogen dioxide has three rotational degrees of freedom. So that's an extra rotational degree of freedom where there can be a lot of disorder because of closely spaced rotational energy states. And that's enough to contribute to substantially higher entropy. If we now look at the various hydrocarbons here, methane, acetylene, ethylene, uh, ethane, there is a steady increase in the entropy. It's not huge amongst, say, the, the C2 isomers. And mostly it's just associated with increasing mass. So I keep adding hydrogen or, or carbon atoms, uh, and that adds to translational entropy. And then there's also a small increase in the rotational moments of inertia uh, for the heavier hydrocarbons. And so I'll, I'll just emphasize one more time that uh, you know, a, a real demonstration of the power of statistical molecular thermodynamics is that it's possible to derive from first principles these third law entropies and derive them with alarming accuracy. Uh, let me do one more somewhat informative comparison, I think, and look at two other gases. Here we have acetone or dimethyl ketone, and here we have trimethylene oxide, so four-membered ring with an oxygen. Uh, you could also call this ox oxetane, common name for that uh, four-membered ring. And they both have molecular formula C3H6O. Right? So they have the same mass, and yet if we look at their respective entropies at 298 Kelvin, it's 298 joules per Kelvin per mole, just a coincidence that it happens to be the same number, 298, as the temperature we're studying. Uh, 298 joule per Kelvin per mole for acetone, 274, so reduced by about 7-8% for trimethylene oxide. So again, a good test of intuition. Why might one expect that sort of behavior? And this one, it's... Uh, a little trickier maybe to point to something trivial like rotation or to at least thinking about the moments of inertia. Perhaps it's not obvious which one should have higher or lower. But certainly what is true is that when we tie this molecule together in a strained ring, it seems like that's going to have less freedom, less disorder, to have motions of the atoms within the molecule. And so if you think about acetone, for example, the CH3 groups attached to the carbonyl, they're nearly free rotors to some extent. So that is an internal degree of freedom where you might expect there to be a lot of energy levels. It's rotating slowly, it's rotating more quickly, that are accessible at room temperature. 
But I can't really rotate about any bond in trimethylene oxide because I've tied all the bonds into a small, tight ring. And really, that shows up. There is less entropy in the molecule on the right than on the left because there is less freedom for internal motions. The last item I'd like to look at, which again sort of shows off the power of uh, this, this uh, first principles analysis, is residual entropy. And so let me tell you a story about carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is an interesting molecule. It has a dipole moment that's illustrated as shown here. It's negative at the carbon end, positive at the oxygen end. If that seems to violate electronegativity, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting molecule. It's a very small dipole moment, but it is oriented in the direction that I've indicated. And it's because there's a pi cloud of electrons, and there's a sigma uh, bond as well. But in the end, it's slightly polarized towards carbon. And if you look at the boiling point of carbon monoxide, 81.6 Kelvin, and ask the question, if I compute using statistical molecular thermodynamics, what's the molar entropy at that temperature? I'll get a value of 160.3 joule per Kelvin per mole. But the measurement, by starting very cold, using a third of the heat capacity, and then integrating up, is 155.6. And that is uh, a residual entropy, that is a difference between calculated and experimental, of it looks like 4.7. That's much larger than anything we've seen before, where pretty much 0.1 was the largest deviation we saw. So, so what might be going on there? Is this a failure of molecular thermodynamics? I, I certainly hope not. And actually, the issue is an interesting one. So because of this very small dipole moment, if we were to make a perfect crystal of carbon monoxide, we would expect it to organize itself so that every dipole was opposed to the dipole next to it, because that's the best orientation for dipoles, and then opposed again, and opposed again, and opposed again. But the interaction between these dipoles is really very, very small. And the problem is that as we're cooling it, we can't really cool it slowly enough that it settles into that final perfect crystal. Instead, it sort of freezes, that's really the right term here, I guess, freezes into a state having higher disorder, where we'll have some aligned dipoles, maybe a few in a row even, and then there's an opposed dipole, and we just didn't get all the way there. So there's residual entropy left in that thing that we're experimentally measuring. We're assigning it as though it's zero, but it's not. It's something a little higher. Well, how much might that be? Well, let's think about that from the standpoint of statistical entropy. We would get that W for a mole if you think of it as though this dipole can be either up or down in the crystal, and we just call them degenerate, we say that they're not actually interacting with each other, well then there would be a degeneracy of two for every one of the molecules. So the total degeneracy then is, for a mole, would be two to Avogadro's number power because they're all independent and they can all be up or down. And so S equals K, the molar entropy equals K log molar W, that's K log two to Avogadro's number, and so I'll take the Avogadro's number out front as a multiplier. It's r log 2. And that says, actually, we're cooling it down to absolute 0, but because we got trapped in this highly degenerate-like crystal, we've got in that crystal not, not 0 entropy, but about 5.7 joules per Kelvin per mole. So if I take the 155.6 that I measured as the increase in entropy, and I add it to not zero, because I never got to zero, but I add it to 5.7, I would be at 161.3. That certainly agrees much more closely with 160.3. It's a little bit high, and that suggests actually that we don't have complete degeneracy. We did manage to get many of the dipoles oriented favorably one to another. We just didn't get all the way there. And so that's residual entropy, and it's kind of a nice indication that actually the statistical molecular thermodynamics is more accurate, potentially, than a measurement, because the measurement requires us to get to the perfect crystal as a starting point. Okay, well, uh, that covers a lot of intuition as well as some interesting thinking about things near absolute zero. In the next video, we'll consider additivity of entropies.